Hi, welcome to Feed Your Soul. I am Melinda and you are watching a video series on the tour portions. I want to just welcome you to this space, especially if it's your first time here. We are followers of Jesus who have really committed to jumping in and diving deep to learn the word of God better than we do, to understand the beginning of the book um, better and uh, as well, or if not better than we understand the end of the book, right? Uh, Jesus's teachings and the whole New Testament are all built on a foundation. And that foundation is the Hebrew scriptures. So this is my labor of love, putting in the things that I have researched over the last 10 to 12 years, really, um, on the front of the Bible. And um, I'm a homeschool mom, or I guess ex-homeschool mom now. My kids are graduated, but this is a compilation of things that I've learned and taught them, plus some newer studies that I've uh because it's every year I learn something new as we go through these. Uh, and this is a space that is really uh, intended to fill kind of a void. I couldn't find a place that I could send my own clients to, right? So I'm a nurse. In addition to being an ex-homeschool mom, I am a nurse and a nutritional therapy practitioner. I do holistic consults for people to help them um, find real health right? Root cause wellness, where we're going to get to the, the root um, of what's going on. And my uh, website is called Nourish Body, Mind, and Soul. And so there's this whole soul piece where there's so much of our health has to do with our emotional well-being and our, our thoughts about who we are and our place in this world. So before we can really work on that piece with people, right? Like how can we use God's promises to help our anxiety or how can we use God's promises to help feelings of sadness or overwhelm? First, we have to know who God is. We have to know why we can rely on his promises. So this is a way to have a foundation for what we believe. We have to know our creator before we can trust our creator, right? We have to know his words, um, are true and good and right and just. Um, and then we can apply those words to our life. So we have to know our God, to know our place in his kingdom and to really know uh, the purpose and really the purpose of our Messiah, the purpose, why did Jesus or Yeshua in Hebrew, why did he come? And all of these things are tied to knowing the Bible, the words of God better than we do. So. That's a little introduction if it's your first time here. If you haven't seen any of these Torah portion videos, I highly recommend you go to the playlist called Torah Study and watch from the beginning. They start back in Genesis and add your questions, your comments, your corrections, um, anything you want to discuss along the way. I get to all the comments. Lay that foundation understand what your Bible is about and really take it on as this language of love. And the better we know our Bible, the better we know our God. And all right. So this week we are looking at the portion entitled Abeshalach. And the titles of the portions come from the first significant words in that portion. Um, this is when he sent more literally in the Hebrew, it is like in sending, in the sending. Um, and it is found in Exodus uh, in ch chapters 13, verse 17 through chapter 17, verse 16. Um, also, we're looking at the prophet pairing Judges 4 to 5. And we're actually doing two New Testament sections this time. And it's John 6 and 7 and Hebrews 16. So I say this every week, but there's a lot. So we better get moving. Um, so in some, in some translations, you will see a different sentence, opening sentence here in verse 17. Um, this is really a closer Hebraic translation. I'm not sure sometimes what translators do. I don't know. Um, uh, but to catch everyone up to where we are, um, Egypt has just had the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn. And Pharaoh was like, get out. He's done with Moses. He's done with the Israelites. He sees um, 
he's seen the wrath of God. Pharaoh has acknowledged he sinned against Yehovah, the God of creation, um, but continued to rebel. And so this was the consequence. And the Israelites were kept safe during that plague of the death of the firstborn from the, the blood of the lamb right over their door. So they have just commemorated Passover and they're leaving. And this is where we pick it up. And so uh, I, I, this verse might sound a little differently in your translation. This was Melinda's translation from the Hebrew. When Pharaoh sent the people out, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see the war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Exodus 14. Then Yehovah said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pihiroth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land and the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. And I will get glory, I will get glory over Passover and all his hosts. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yehovah. And so they did. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people. And they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with, and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And Jehovah hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. Um, that Hebrew word I had peeked at, it's um, more like with arms raised defiantly. It's uh, maybe in fists or maybe in prayer and celebration, but um, it was with arms raised. They were going out with hands raised. The Egyptians pursued them all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamped by the sea at Pil at P ha Hiroth, um, in front of Baal Zephon. And remember this hardened, we talked about it last week. And I think the week before where, um, there was two different words about hardening and Pharaoh really did play the part in, in, rebelling against God, hardening his heart. And then God kind of took over. Pharaoh only had a certain amount of time that he could ignore the hand of God before God said, okay, now you've gone too far. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to Jehovah. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what you said? Nope. Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, fear not, Stand firm and see the salvation, the Yeshua of Yehovah, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. And Yehovah will fight for you. And you have only to be silent. Or some versions say be still. It really means the same thing. 
Yehovah will fight for you. You just need stillness and silence. And Yehovah said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yehovah when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud moved before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and Yehovah drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters being a wall to them on the right hand and their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses his chariots and his horsemen. And in the morning, watch Yehovah in the pillar of fire and the cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels. So as they drove, as they drove heavily, um, and the clogging is actually swerving, it sounds like in, he in Hebrew. So they were swerving back and forth. They couldn't uh, control their chariots. And the Egyptians... And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for Yehovah fights for them against the Egyptians. Yeah, so they're fleeing, so they're pursuing them, and now they're turning around. Then Yehovah said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, Yehovah threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus Yehovah saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw that the Egyptian saw the Egyptians dead on the shore. Israel saw the great power that Yehovah used against the Egyptians. So the people feared Yehovah and they believed in Yehovah and in his servant, Moses. They believed in both. So there is a parallel passage here in Jubilees. And if you haven't been following along, you don't probably know much about Jubilees. Most Christians don't, um, but we've talked about it kind of in depth in other videos. It's an extra biblical book that is um, said to be given to Moses by the angel on Mount Sinai. So it talks in the first person. And when it says I or me, it's talking about um, the angel who's actually speaking and um, we're going to talk about who this angel is. We've actually kind of meet him now in the narrative. Um, okay, Jubilees 48, verse 10. Even after all these signs and wonders, Prince Mastima, which is Satan in the book of Jubilees, was not put to shame because he took courage and cried to the Egyptians to pursue you with all the power the Egyptians had, with their chariots and their horses and with all the hosts of the peoples of Egypt. But I stood between the Egyptians and Israel, and we delivered Israel out of his hand and out of the hand of his people. Yah brought them through the middle of the sea as if it were dry land. Yah, our Elohim, through all the people whom he, Mastima, Satan, brought to pursue Israel into the middle of the sea and into the depths of the bot bottomless pit beneath the children of Israel. Even as the people of Egypt had thrown Israel, Israel's children into the sea, into the river. He took vengeance on 1 million of them. In addition, 1,000 strong and energetic men were destroyed because of the death of the suckling children of your people. 
which they had thrown into the river on the 14th day and on the 15th day and on the 16th day and on the 17th and on the 18th days, Prince Mestima was bound and imprisoned and placed behind the children of Israel so that he might not accuse them on the 19th day. We let them, Mestima and his demons loose so that they might help the Egyptians pursue the children of Israel. He hardened their hearts and made them stubborn. And the plan devised by Yah, our Elohim, that he might strike the Egyptians and throw them into the sea. So we get a little background here of what was causing Pharaoh to go, right? And this Jubilees does out, outright say that it was the work of Satan to use Pharaoh to pursue Israel. Um, and then I wanted to talk about this miracle, right? Of course, of the people walking through the sea. But before we talk about that, I wanna talk about the pillar of fire and the um, pillar of smoke. So we have the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And this is how we see that God leads the children of Israel, the nation of Israel out of Egypt and then through the wilderness. And, and when this pillar moves, the whole nation was supposed to move with this presence, right? With, with what the, the word um, that we just read calls this Yehovah, the Lord in, in all caps, remember is the proper name for God in the Bible, but it also says the angel of the Lord. Um, and it says the angel of the Lord moved behind them, right? To uh, be between the Egyptians and the Israelites. So I think sometimes we try really hard to decide what this is, right? Is this God? Is this uh, pre-incarnate Yeshua, Jesus? Um, Christians let, love to put a pre-incarnate Jesus everywhere we can, but we need to remember, especially with looking at uh, jubilees, right? So I have bolded this verse here. Um, it says, but I stood between Egypt and Israel, right? So I stood there. Who moved to the back? It was the angel, the angel of the Lord. And, and we shouldn't read past. It's uh, that um, messenger, right? Of, of Yehovah. It is his, um, his representative, on earth, these angels, and they are um, the archangels, like there are definitely uh, positioning um, levels of angels, right, where they have different jobs, and these highest, these angels of the most high are the highest levels of angels, and they come and they speak for God, because remember, we can't see God. He, he has made himself smaller. He has backed himself away from his full presence in humanity, because if he were to be here, he would consume it all right? There would be no space for us. No one can see the father and live um, except the son. So, and the angels, right? So we have the angels here. And I just want to remind us as we're pulling these threads. So this is what we do here on Feed Your Soul. We find the threads that, that start back in the beginning of Genesis and we just keep pulling them through. And this angel of the Lord is a really important theme because this is the messenger. There is an idea of coming in the name of God, right? That there is um, a, a being able to speak for the father, being able to speak for the king. Um, that is something we see being given to angels all throughout the Bible. And we just need to remember that there is this population, this, this type of creation, right? Created beings that were made in order to minister to people, to speak for God, and to be God's hands and feet and eyes in, in the world and um, to understand the world in which we live in and the kingdom of God, we need to understand this idea. And it's really called agency, right? Um, it's, it was a well-known thing in ancient culture. Um, you came in the name of your king and the words you said were like the king's words. They were the king's words. There was no real memos to be sent and there was no emails. You know, you couldn't get on TV and make a proclamation. You sent someone who had the agency to speak for you. And this is really what these angels did. 
So that's a little aside, but I just want to, as we see over and over again, we're going to see the angel of the Lord, but also speaking from um, like a first person in the name of the Lord, from, from Yehovah's first person point of view, he's speaking the words of God, but he is the messenger, the agent coming to speak. Uh, and here's an example of it here. So the people walked through dry ground. I mean, it is just such an amazing picture of God's providence, God's protection, God's deliverance. Um, and water becomes such a huge, significant, it already has been, right? Water is a very significant theme flowing through the Bible, pun intended, I guess. Um, but as they walk through on dry land, um, there's this idea of a mikvah, like a baptism, right? Walking through the water onto the other side, they go in kind of a fearful people, you know, really wondering if they're, they're going to live through this. And on the other side, they really become a nation, right? There's this birth, this water, think of, um, like the waters of birth, right? And then it also has this great symbolism when the waters go and cover the Egyptians and kill them. It's this symbolism of what happened to their firstborn. And, and Jubilee says this right out, that this was um, the consequence for what they did to the Hebrew babies. And really, if you remember, this Pharaoh would have been the firstborn of the Pharaoh who was throwing the babies into the Nile, likely. This was likely that firstborn, possibly even the um, kind of brother even that that Moses grew up in with, it, who Moses grew up with in the palace, in the Egyptian household, right? Because everyone who was looking for Moses was dead when Moses came back from the wilderness to set his people free. So the father Pharaoh who had been ordered the the Hebrew babies dead was dead and now here is his firstborn in that same watery grave right that he had ordered all those babies so it's it's big it's sad in a in a way of, of like what lost life always is but that God God sees God sees the suffering of his people he sees the suffering of the people who love him and um and yeah, and this was the plan, was to end that reign of that Pharaoh and that um, part of Egypt's rule was to end it in a watery grave. So now we're on the other side of the shore, we're on Exodus 15 and Moses sings a song, right? I wish we had the music to this. Then Moshe, and the people of Israel sang this song to Yehovah, saying, I will sing to Yehovah, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider, he has thrown into the sea. Yehovah is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my Elohim, and I will praise him. My father's Elohim, and I will exalt him. Yehovah is a man of war, the, and Yehovah is his name. Pharaoh's chariot and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Yehovah, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Yehovah, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. And the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. And the floods stood up in a heap, the deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue and I will overtake. And the heart just is jumping out at me just this time that the heart, the hardening of the heart was a theme that has really pulled through. And so, um, yeah, there's another kind of symbolic line in the song. Okay. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake. Um, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Yehovah, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. 
the earth swallow them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The people have heard, they tremble. The pangs have seized in the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone till your people, O Jehovah, pass by, till the heavens pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Jehovah, which you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established, Yehovah will reign forever and ever. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, Yehovah brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing, and Miriam sang a song to them. Sing to Jehovah, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider, he is thrown into the sea. So whether or not Miriam just picked this up as a chorus, these two lines, or she went on to sing the rest of the song, we don't know. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron in a moment. When Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried to Jehovah and Jehovah showed him a log and he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. And there Jehovah made for them a statute and a rule. And there he tested them saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of Jehovah, your Elohim, and do that, which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians for I am Jehovah, your healer, your healer. And they came to Elim where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. And they encamped there by the water. So there is so much we could talk about from that chapter so much um a beautiful song right and this is not a very good quality picture but i just thought that this is what we're going to talk about i never knew i don't know how i read over it i don't know how many times i read this chapter and i didn't pick up that miriam was called a prophetess and why did it call her uh, miriam the, the sister of aaron right she's also the sister of moses but um the sages say, rabbis say that it is because it's referring to the time where, where she had become a prophet, a prophetess, was back even before Moses was born, that she was the one really proclaiming to her parents that God was going to provide and God was going to come through. There's this story about um, Moses's father and, and Jubilees picks up on this. Moses's father is, um, moves, they take... Uh, People go to Canaan, but some of the Israelites have gone to Canaan back when they were able to come and move freely um, from out of Egypt. Um, and part of why he had went is because many of the men, apparently, and this is a story, had decided to divorce their wives to stop having children in order to keep them from being killed. And it was Miriam who said, this is not the way we trust God by just stopping um, the procreation, the, the perpetuation of our nation is not it. And that she was prophesying um, or reminding them even maybe of the prophecy about Moses that uh, Jacob would have received according to the book of Jubilees. So that she was the one who um, prophesied, prophet, had a prophecy about uh the coming savior of 
the salvation of Israel. And that we just want to follow Miriam through, first of all, what her name means. Her name is from the word Mara, which means bitter, right? We just heard that um, the water was bitter, but the, the log, whatever this purification, if it was a type of wood that purifies, I don't know, but it was um, sweetened when this log was thrown in. Um, but it's not just bitter that this word means, it's also rebel or rebellious, rebel. And if you follow Miriam and, and don't take the word rebel as, as a negative connotation, but the positive kind, right? Like in Star, Star Wars, the rebellion, they were the good guys, right? Um, that she, she was a rebel. She stood there on the store, on the shore of the sea, watching her baby brother being put in the basket and who knows what's going to happen, right? She doesn't know the end of the story. And here comes, here comes Pharaoh's daughter. And what does she do? Does she get afraid? Does she hide? Does she look away? This could be the end of her brother's life in that basket, in that, in that, in the reeds. But she boldly walks up to Pharaoh's daughter and says, I know who can take care of this baby and, and gets to bring Moses back to her, his mother. Right. And she stood and watched and she has been present through all of this. She believed that Moses was the promised child to Israel and, and she acted upon that. And here she is with her brothers walking through the Red Sea, leading the women in song, um, celebrating what has happened. And we'll see as you, as you see about Miriam throughout her whole story, she's always connected to water. She was connected to her brother being in the basket in the river. Um, she's connected here to the Red Sea. She sings after they come through the, the water. And then also um, the, the bitter water. Um, Miriam is, she's always spoken ab about um, in connection to water. And I think that's really significant. Um, this is me and my ponderings throughout my studies. Um, we also know another Miriam, right? Jesus's mother, Mary, her name's Miriam as well. Same name, same Hebrew name. And there's this connection of this name being connected to water. Water in Hebrew is mine. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's a direct connection linguistically, but they both begin and end with the letter Mem. And the letter Mem really does symbolize water and even chaos, um, the unpredictable attributes of water. And there's something else really about water that this might be off topic, but I'm going to go there anyway, of just women in general really do represent water because in the birth process, we supply the egg and the egg is basically cytoplasm, right? The, the, the more of the nucleus and, and comes from the, the sperm, but the egg is much of it is, is water structured water, cellular water, cytoplasm. And that's really what we give to our children. Um, that, that's what we give, that the nourishing water of life, living waters even. Um, and so there is this real connection and the fact that that is what Mary, Jesus's mother, supplied for our Messiah was the egg, living water, cytoplasm, and her name's Miriam. It's kind of a cool connection that I'm still working out in my head. So, um, all right, Miriam connected to water, watch for that as we continue to read through not even just this portion, but um, the next several portions until her death. And it really, um, the, the connection we'll see all the way through, but she's a rebel. She's a rebel against oppression. She's a prophetess um, at a time where women weren't necessarily the, looked at as leaders, but clearly they weren't not leaders. Here she is leading the women in song, praising the Lord for what he has done. I love it. Okay. Exodus 16, they set out from Elim and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled 
And let's remember the word grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of Jehovah in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out to the wilderness to kill us, this whole assembly with hunger. Then Jehovah said to Moses, behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, at evening, you shall know that it was Jehovah who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, you shall see the glory of Jehovah because he has heard your grumbling against Jehovah. For what are we that you grumble against us? Moses said, when Jehovah gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because Jehovah has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against Jehovah. So they're complaining at Moses and Moses is like, I didn't, this is not me. You have to start relying on him. Right. And there's grumbling, grumbling, grumbling. The word is used over and over and over again. Um, it's maybe a word for doubting as well. In the evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness, a fine flake like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? for they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that Jehovah has given you to eat. This is what Jehovah has commanded. Gather of it, each of you, as much as you can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever, other, whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat, and Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what Jehovah has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath, Shabbat, to Jehovah. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil, and all that is left over, lay it aside to be kept until the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them and it did not stink and there were no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today for today is a Sabbath to Yehovah. Today, you will not find it in the field. Six days, you shall gather it. But on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And Yehovah said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, Yehovah has given you Sabbath, the Sabbath. Therefore, this, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now the house of Israel called its name manna or man in Hebrew. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like what wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what Jehovah has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before Jehovah to be kept throughout your generations. As Jehovah commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. And the people of Israel ate manna 40 years till they came to a habitable land 
they ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is a tenth part of an ephah, in case you needed that note. Bread from heaven, right? This is such a cool, there's so much going on here. Okay, I say that every chapter, but there is so much going on here, right? So we have provision, bread from, literally bread from heaven. I like to think about this, right? So as we're thinking about angels, angels actually existing um, in heaven, being um, beings like Jesus was after he rose from the dead. Um, remember Jesus rose. He had a body that could be touched. He ate with his um, people, with his disciples. And it is talked about that we will have feasts, a wedding feasts. We will have uh, biblical holidays where we eat in the kingdom of God, um, in the new Jerusalem, right? So when we have heavenly bodies, we will still be eating. And so it makes me wonder, is this the food of angels, right? This is actually angelic food, what they may be eat um, as part of whatever they're doing in heaven, ministering and, and celebrating holidays um, on the biblical calendar. So this is food from heaven that God is providing for his people. And there's talk here about a few laws. And I just want to pause for a moment. We have been, that's one of the threads we've been pulling through is that there have been commandments, um, instructions really is a better, the, the word Torah really um, is better translated as instructions instead of law. God has given his people instructions since the garden. Um, some of them were progressive, progressive revelation, but um, there had clearly been an idea of ministering to God, bringing sacrifice, um, what is right in the eyes of the Lord, like murder and things like that. Like there was, Adam had much of the Torah of, of Yehovah. Um, and he passed it down and, and some newer additions happened along the way as, as they needed to be revealed to the people, but commandments aren't new. I want to, you to notice that here we talked about Sabbath in this portion, and it's, I believe it's the first time Sabbath Shabbat is used as a noun. Um, God said that he would rest like kind of as a verb, um, on the seventh day back in creation. But now we're seeing this is kind of a known thing. You will Shabbat. This is Shabbat. This is rest. The seventh day is rest. So God is reintroducing and also building upon his instructions, but in the most gentle of ways, what are the instructions he's giving these freed prisoners, right? They were prisoners. They were slaves. Their lives were not their own. They may have been well-fed, but their babies were being thrown into a river and murdered. They were working in more harsher and, and harsher conditions for Pharaoh. They were, um, they could be beaten or killed. Um, their lives were not their own. And this was building to something, right? This was not going to end at building bricks. Likely this whole idea, this was going to be the eradication of the people because the problem that Pharaoh had was they were too numerous. And as they continued to be numerous, this was going to continue to pose a threat on Egypt. It was going to be genocide, right? So these were people who were fearing for their lives and now they're out of that. And there's a whole psychological thing that goes along with that. And here is God introducing himself as a caring king. He is the lawgiver like Pharaoh was, but he is the lawgiver of compassion and care. And so now his, the first laws that he's introducing to his people here, the first instructions are about food, provisions, and rest. Just think, we, we think, we've been told as Christians, many of us have, that the law is a burden. The Torah of Moses was for not us because that was a burden that we don't need to bear. I'm telling you, I promise you that God did not just take these people out of the burden of slavery to then put them on them a burden of the Torah. He didn't. That's not the God we know. He pulled them out of the burden of slavery to bring them into his care and his instruction that were for his good. 
Do we think a fish is being burdened because part of his laws of existence are he has to be in water? Or if he comes out of water, he'll die? Of course not. Human beings have specific laws, specific instructions that we need to follow in order to flourish, in order to be our best selves um, and for his kingdom to flourish, right? And so this is a longer aside than I may be meant to get into, but as we, this is, it's really this point forward that I want you as the followers of Jesus to understand our God did not put laws and instructions on the people he just freed from slavery. He did not bring them out of slavery to put them into bondage. So we need to get the idea of God's instructions being negative or bondage or too much or too hard, or even, uh, and I've heard this said in like from the pulpit that his laws were too much for us and we could never do them. And that's why we needed a savior. In fact, the Torah says differently that they're not too hard, that these instructions are not too far away, um, but that they are within our reach. We needed a savior. We needed Yeshua to come. And we've talked about why he came. Um, and we'll talk about that more, but we, it wasn't because these were too hard. There are instructions for life. They're life-giving and they're protective. And just think about this, these people who are, are scarred, you know, you, you don't live in slavery in the land of your captors and have all your baby boys be thrown to their death and drowned and eaten by crocodiles. You don't live through that and not be scarred, not have trauma. These people have trauma. And God is telling these traumatized people that he is their God. He is their deliverer. He is their provider. They will lean on him for bread, for water, and for rest. Not for brick making, right? Not for, um, not to serve him in that way, but to serve them. God, not to serve God in the way that they were serving Pharaoh but to serve God with their lives and their hearts and their allegiance and that they can know that they can depend on him. And so I'm challenging anyone who has these thoughts of the law being a burden that we couldn't follow so that Jesus came to take it off of us. I'm challenging that thought. I want you to set that aside. And I want you to see the words of our God in context to people who needed care, to a traumatized people who needed him. He certainly didn't pull them out of slavery in order to put them back into bondage. Okay, bread from heaven. Exodus 17, all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of Yehovah and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water again, for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test Yehovah? So still they're looking at Moses when really they're supposed to be looking at Yehovah. And that's what he's saying. Your, your, your quarrel isn't with me. Talk to God. But the people thirsted there for water and the people grumbled again against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to Yehovah, what shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And Yehovah said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Oreb. And you shall strike the rock and the water and water shall come out of it and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of this place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel. And because they tested the Yehovah by saying, is Yehovah among us or not? We have grumbling, we have water, we have testing, we have these themes, these threads that are beginning to emerge here, right? Um, 
Moses with his staff in hand, again, right? The staff has really provided him with, um, God has asked him to use the staff that's in his hand over and over again at this point. Um, he strikes the rock, water comes. And we hear about testing, right? So God is testing them. What does that mean exactly? So, so it, it's not, I think if you, on one level, you can really look at this at this quarreling people, they just weren't satisfied and nothing was enough um, on one hand and, and God was angry with them on another hand. But when you stop and kind of look at these rules he's providing, right? Again, they're about food and rest. It's like a lot of care. And that when they needed something, they were kind of grumbling, going about it wrong because they didn't have that trust built yet. So they're they're going to Moses who they can see. They're like, what? where's our water, right? And Moses is like, hey, talk to Yehovah. He's the one who will provide it. So there's this dance going on. It's not me, it's him, right? Go to him. Um, and when we get to the end of this portion here, we're gonna talk again about the connection of test, um, of the bread and water and and then this banner right this um this banner okay this banner this sign this signal um of who god is okay so here just this little aside about amalek in exodus 17 8 then amalek came and fought with israel at rephidim so moses said to joshua yahushua um Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were weary, so they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. And then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, Yehovah is my banner. And that's actually uh, Yehovah uh, Nisi, Nisi, saying a hand upon the throne of Yehovah and Yehovah will have a war with Amalek from generation to generation. I think it's, a, I think it is um, the Septuagint that says that God will have the secret hand like on Amalek to keep him him down through generation to generation. Um, so Nisi or Nace banner signal, um, uh, like something up in the air for you to look at. This is what, um, who God is. And those hands, I was looking for uh, some background on what, what was going on and really pr prayer, like that, that Moses was praying the whole time and that it took multiple people to help give Moses this the strength to pray through the whole time to just be like this is lifting his hands up to heaven right saying this is his battle he will win it for us um and so there's some some threads like we keep saying right and they're gonna start building things um and this is one piece of the thread um that I've just I, it's still in progress in my head, um, but I couldn't keep thinking on it. it. Here we are, Shabbat. It needed to get on video. Um, it's part of, it's like the bittersweetness of, of getting these recorded because it's like, it'll be a half an hour or two days later. I think of other things I would have added, but that's okay. So we have NASA, um, which is the testing, right? NASA, um, I might pronounce it wrong, but this is the Hebrew word here. And remember, we read Hebrew from right to left. So nasa, um, it means to test or prove or a trial. And so over and over again, we hear this word, though, before I say over and over again, the, this word is really um, isn't used that much in the Torah. The first time it's used is the test with Abraham. 
and Isaac the Akita, the binding of Isaac. Um, then we see it in this story about, it's always has to do with kind of the grumbling or the needs of Israel. Um, and then we see it one other time uh, in numbers, when the spies come back with the with the bad report, the ten spies have the bad report, and the people um, are grumbling, and that's really all we see it in in the whole Torah. Um, and so this word seems to be directly connected to when the people are saying there's not enough. And I heard. Um, this isn't a test, like when you take one in school and you're given just to see what you know. But I heard this, uh, it was one of the rabbis, I, I'm not gonna remember which one, so I'm not gonna guess, but one of the older you know, Hebraic sages that said testing, a test by God is bringing something from potentiality into actuality. And I find that to be amazing. You know, what, what are tests? Sometimes we don't, sometimes we just don't know why things happen to us in our lives and it feels like a test. And sometimes we pass those tests and sometimes we don't, but what is the purpose that we have something in us that God knows can come out and that we won't bring out of our potential into our actual life. We won't do that without this, um, this test or this, this thing that's in our way that we have to learn how to get over and through. And so that's beautiful, right? So God is allowing Israel to be tested because they need to learn to depend on him. They need to, he needs to bring out of them what's, what's latent and, and in them as a potential. And he needs to bring that out into actuality. So if we think about testing in that way, but when they were testing him, that became something different because it's not their job to bring out God's potential, right? Um, so don't test the Lord in this way, right? Just come to me and ask. You don't need to bring something out or God is not someone who has like this need for growth, right? And then this word just seems to be continually connected with nace. And nace is... Um, banner, sign, standard. It's the same word used uh, when the serpent gets put up on the pole. Um, it becomes the, the signal, the, the banner that, that Israel looks to to get healed. And uh, Yeshua compares himself to that uh, later on. This nace, sometimes you hear it referred to as, as miracle, but it's not quite miracle. It's like the sign, the banner. Um, and so there's this unfinished thought about um this this connection in these two words it seemed like some hebrew sources will connect these two words linguistically and others won't but there seems to be a connection between the testing and the sign and when you are being tested and there is this this something from potential being come out into actual actual reality that there will also be a banner, a sign, a signal um, for you to look at and know that your God is the one there um, in the midst of this trial, in the midst of this test, helping you grow. So that's the unfinished thought. Um, if you have thoughts about these words, let me know. These words also somehow seem to be connected to water and the bread of life too. Um, there is just this testing, this rumbling. Um, and so we're going to get quickly into uh, two quick New Testament portions where we talk about um, the bread of life and the water, the living water here. Um, but these seem, this is more part of this is like unfinished in my mind, but there was grumbling here. Um, when we talk about the, the bread, when Jesus talks about that, he is the bread, right? That is better than the, the bread that Moses was given. People had um, just been hungry um, and, and, and Yeshua had just had this miracle, this sign um, of the loaves and fishes. And so people had just eaten their fill. Um, and so we're kind of catching up with Yeshua and his disciples here in John six after that. So when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, 
when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the son of man will give to you. For on him, God, the father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus, Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Yeshua Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my father gives you true bread from heaven for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you, that you have seen me and yet do not believe. And please go to John six, read the rest of this. Um, they, there's grumbling that happens. He tells them again that he is the bread um, of life and so cool, but still they are saying that Moses had was the one given the bread, right? Um, that our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. And he said, yeah, it was not Moses who gave it to them. It was the father. And guess where I come from? I come from the father. And then so later on, um, we don't know exactly how much time has passed between here and there, but we're in the, the, the next chapter in John where we have the feast, the holiday of Sukkot tabernacles. And this is, he, Jesus gets up and speaks a few times in the middle of the feast. Here we are at the end. It's a seventh day feast with the last day. It's an eighth day. It's, it's the day of addition, which if you read through Jubilees, there's some cool connections there about what the day of addition is, but it's the last great day. Um, the eighth day points to eternity, so much symbolism, but there's also like a celebration for water. This is the fall harvest. Um, they need to pray for rain um, in the next, in the coming agri agricultural year, we're moving into the, the wetter portion of the um, Israeli weather calendar. And so it is a tradition to have like a water ceremony. Um, it's about praying for rain, about trusting God. We don't get a harvest without rain that comes from God. And so it's during this ceremony, during this day that Jesus comes up with this proclamation about himself, John 7, verse 37, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Yeshua stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given because Yeshua was not glorified. So we have living water. We have it related to also bread of life. We have it related to kind of grumbling and complaining. Um, and we have it related to signs, uh, miracles, banners, things to look at um, and look up to. So it's kind of cool connections there. Yeah, it's there's, I say this every week, but there's so much to unpack. We can't get it all in, but we want to get over to the prophet pairing because it's some of my favorites and we probably won't read through every word, but we'll read through um, chapter four. This piece right here, these first couple of um, verses in Judges four were not, are not actually part of the portion, but I feel like it's good to read the first couple of verses in a chapter for context, right? So after Ehud died, the Israelites again did evil in the sight of Yehovah. So Yehovah sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his forces was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagoim. Harosheth Hagoim, right? Then the Israelites cried out to Yehovah because Jabin had 900 chariots of iron and he had harshly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. 
So Israelites misbehaving, God gave them into the hand of this um, Canaanite commander. Uh, read through the after the Torah, like there's a ton, right? There's these history books, Joshua, Judges, um, really good background information for the rest of what goes on in the Tanakh and the Hebraic scriptures. So if you haven't read that recently, I highly recommend you get to those books as well. Um, but let's join in our profit pairing here now in Judges 4.4. 4. Now, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came to her for judgment. So you can probably already see the connections here. We have a prophetess um, who was leading the people of Israel. She sent and summoned Barak, the, the son of uh, Abinom, from Kadesh, Naphtali, and said to him, has not Yehovah, the God of Israel, commanded you to gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun? And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go, but if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For Yehovah will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Now, if you don't know the story, you think the woman's Deborah, but it's not. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And 10,000 men went up at his heels and Deborah went with him. Now Heber the Kenite, had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hoab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent far away as the oaks in Zenanim, that's a lot of ends, Zenanim, which is near Kadesh, right? So we have this other people, it's actually Moses's in-laws, their descendants, um, and they are also part of the story. We have Canaanites, Israelites, and then the Kenites. When Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinom, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him from uh, Harosheth Hagoim to the river Kishon, and Deborah and Barak. Deborah said to Barak, up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not Yehovah go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him and Yehovah rooted Sisera and all his chariots and his armies before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot and Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harosheth Hagoyim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left, but Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in Hebrew, remember, there's it would be a Y sound. Yael, yeah, yeah. the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, "Turn aside, my lord. Turn aside to me and do not be afraid." So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. He said to her, please give me a little water to drink for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, standing at the opening of the tent. And if any stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, is anyone here? Say no. So he's saying, hide me here and give me water. But she gave him milk. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand, and she went softly to him and drove the, pen, the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said, come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent and there lay Sisera with the tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel, and the hand of the people of Israel 
pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Gabin, the king of Canaan. Whoa. We have Deborah, the prophetess and judge, and maybe even the leader of the army, because the leader, the commander of the army wouldn't even go unless she came. So if she's the if she's the leader of the commander of the army, is she not the commander of the army? So we have Deborah giving a prophecy that, yeah, Brock, sure, I'm going to come with you, but you are not going to win this battle. And we have Jael, Moses's, I don't know, in-law, um, great granddaughter or something, um, who wins this battle with a tent peg. And so then uh, Deborah has this song, which I'm not going to read through the whole song. It's getting long here, but go read through it. Go to Judges 5, read Deborah's song about how um, God gave them this victory. And so you can see how it relates, right, to Miriam having a song to sing in, in praise and triumph. Um, uh, one line here depends on the depends on the translation, but this says the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. Um, there's a translation that says the the earth um, shook and the heavens rained. And it's just beautiful. The mountains quaked before the Lord. He is the one um, who, who causes the triumphs. And this line down here where I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel, right? She was in charge. Um, she was the one taking care of Israel. Um, and it just goes on. It's beautiful. Uh, and it ends really with um, most blessed of women, BJL, the wife of Heber the Kenite of tw tent dw dwelling women, most blessed. And that is like a nod to the other tent dwelling uh, women of God, Sarah, um, Rebecca, Rachel, um, Leah. And it just continues to tell her story. She sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Um, between her feet, he sank. He fell. He lay still. Between her feet, he sank. He fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. So JL ends this battle, ends this, uh, was it 20, 20 years of oppression, um, and then at the end of this, the land had rest for 40 years. So between Deborah and Jael, the um, Israel had peace for 40 years. And so, yeah, rock on, right? So we have these two women here, um, Jael and Deborah. And this is from sarahbethart.com. Um, she has these beautiful portraits of all these women um, from the Bible. Go buy things from her. It's gorgeous. Whoever your favorite woman in the Bible is, get a print. Um, she's great. But we have women, right? These strong women who needed to step up because um, clearly people around them were not. And God uses women. God uses strong, rebellious women, even like Miriam, right? All through be the story of his of his nation right and the sages say that god uses women that women were integral in the saving and preserving of the nation of israel in egypt and that they will be integral in ushering um the nation of of, of israel forward into the kingdom come um, and we see that, right? We see, we see the brave, um, the brave midwives, that's the word, the brave midwives uh, who were not killing the baby boys. We see Miriam, we see Jacobed, ja um, Moses's mother. We see Miriam, Moses's sister. We see women, uh, even, um, Pharaoh's daughter is, is, is a brave woman who says, I'm not going to keep this cycle of death going, right? She saves this baby boy's life um, and, and on and on uh, throughout the story. And we see this all the way, you know, we, in these two strong women here in the prophet pairing, and we see it in Miriam, the mother of Yeshua, which I should have put a picture of her here as well, that she is another Miriam who is strong 
and courageous and is willing to take on this very scary position of having a baby and having to know that people are going to talk about her and, and really this, her doing what she was doing, stepping forth and saying that she will bring Messiah into the world. Um, she really put her life on the line um, because she was going to be accused of adultery and, and on and on. And, but she was brave and she was strong. And we just see the strength of women. Like it's, of course, there are strong men. The patriarchs were, were these men of God who, who just carried the words of the Lord to his people over and over and over again. But sometimes we pass over the, the women who were by their side, who were walking together with them and partnering with them to bring Israel into its nationhood and then to, um, and, and who are still ushering the nation of God, the people of God into his kingdom come. So that brings me to Romans 16. And why we are looking at this today is because it's, yes, a salutation of a letter, but the names in this letter that just maybe, and oftentimes are just read right past right past, right? We don't even notice them. Uh, and there's one thing I learned recently, like over the last few months, that this Romans 16 verse one, depending on the version of the Bible you have, I bet you it says servant and it doesn't say deacon, right? We have, I commend, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a deacon. That is the Greek word. It's like deaconess or deacon, whatever, whatever the Greek word for deacon is, it's deacon. When it's a man who is a deacon, oftentimes we, they use the word deacon or they use the word minister. When it is Phoebe who is called the deacon, most of your versions of your Bible, open it now, it will say servant. So that right there, we have this preconceived idea in like recent history that a woman couldn't be a deacon, but if women can be prophetess, a prophetess and a judge and a winner of a battle in, in, in a significant battle, right? Winning, winning battles for the Lord. If, if women can be integral in all parts of the walk of the, of the nation of God into the kingdom of God, of course, Phoebe can be a deacon. Okay. I commended, I commend to you, our sister Phoebe, who is a deacon in the church of Centra, Centria, welcome her in the Lord as one who is worthy of honor among God's people. Help her in whatever she needs, for she has been helpful to many and especially to me. Oftentimes the deacon is the one who takes the letter and reads it out loud and who will field answers to questions. Um, okay. And notice that um, as I keep reading the people, the um, bolded portions here are the um, women. That, that Paul is greeting. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. In fact, they once risked their lives for me and I am thankful to them. And so are all the Gentile churches. Also give my greetings to the church that meets in their home. Greet my friend uh, Epenetus. He was the first person from the province of Asia to become a follower of Christ. Give my greetings to Mary. Mary. Miriam, who works so hard for your benefit. Greet uh, Adronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews or my fellow kin, who were in prison with me. They are highly respected among the apostles and became followers of Christ before I did. Greet uh, Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Sakis. Sakis. Greet uh, uh, Pelus a good man whom Christ approves and give my greetings to the believers from the household of Aristobulus and Herodian, my fellow Jew or kin. Greet the Lord's people from the house of Narcissus, Narcissus and give my greetings to Tryphena and Tryphosa, the Lord's workers, likely sisters and probably twins even. And to dear Persis, who has worked so hard for the Lord. Greet Rufus, whom the Lord picked out to be his very own, and also his dear mother, who has been a mother to me. Give my greetings to Asinorit. 
I'm not doing well with these Greek names. Uh, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who meet with them. Give my greetings to a Philologus, Phil, Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and to Olympus and all the believers who met with them. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. All the churches of Christ send you their greeting. Okay, so of the 29 people greeted by Paul, 10 are women. Um, seven of the 10 women are described in terms of their ministry. Phoebe, Prisca, Mary, Junia, Tryphena, and Tryphosa, and Persis. By comparison, only three men are described in terms of their ministry, Aquila, Andronicus, and Urbanus, right? So we are, he's singling out actually um, seven of the women for specifically what they do in ministry. Two of these men are ministering alongside female partners, right? So even the men that he said, um, gave a nod to about their ministry, their partners are females. And these numbers are worth remembering. They're worth remembering because women have a place in leadership, in the people of God, in the congregation of our most high. And they always have. Um, and sometimes in some realms, in some sects of, of Christianity and religiosity, and even in Judaism, in, in, we lose that. God made women strong. He made women with leadership skills. He made women smart and um, good in ministry. And we cannot discount that. Um, we have Miriam, the prophetess. We have Deborah, the prophetess. We have all of these women, Phoebe, the deacon. These things are important to remember. Um, and we want to be careful because there are versions of the Bible out there who change some of this language, like with servant and deacon with Phoebe. Not, not cool. Not cool, ESV. <laughs> not cool. You know, because deacon means deacon, minister. Um, we're not going to change it just for the women and not change it for the men and to serve it. We need to remember that God made us to be partners, co-heirs in the kingdom of God, um, both made in his image. And I think that this tour portion and this prophet portion just highlight this more than maybe any other portion. And I love it. And this is from baremarriage.com. And I love this little illustration, be a biblical woman, right? A lot of times we see biblical womanhood as being this meek and mild person who just can like sew and bake bread, but be a biblical woman, love like Ruth, hope like Anna, lead like Deborah, prophesy like Miriam, believe like Elizabeth, pray like Hannah, teach like Priscilla, protect like Abigail, minister like Tabitha, serve like Martha, support like Joanna, exhort like Phoebe, mentor like Lois, show hospitality like Lydia, win battles like Jael, say no like Vashti, it's another can of worms, stand up like Esther, seek justice like Tamar, choose God like Rahab, speak truth like Huldah, work hard like a Tryphena, be devoted to our savior like the Marys, or the Miriams these rebel women, right? Because that's what Miriam means. Bitter, but no, rebellious rebel. This isn't about some crazy feminist movement, right? But like maybe historical feminism of where women can stand up shoulder to shoulder with men um, in as equals in the eyes of God. And <laughs> really the Bible especially for the time it was written in, look at every time women are talked about in the Bible. They are, they are lifted up from the position they are in um, socially. They're protected. There are rules put around their treatment um, and they're honored. In every time women are talked about in the word of God, they are protected and honored, honestly. Tell me if you, you see a place where, where I might be mistaken. Certainly there are, there's correction and, and women do get correction and we're going to see Miriam get corrected. Um, but women are elevated from the place that society, even may I say patriarchy keeps trying to push them down to. 
patriarchy is a work of patriarchy in the way that it uh, pushes people down is not of God. We are made both in him, in his image um, to do his will. And they're really, yeah. And if you've never seen it, watch the Ezra Konegdo um, uh, video about Eve. Um, I wanted to do, start a series about women and I don't think I got very far, but there is that one and it is who women are. Uh, Ezra Konegdo, that, that rescuing um, helper of, of, of men, right? It really has a connotation of strength and rescue um, and not subservience. So, okay, I'm not going to go off anymore on that. This is the end of this portion. Thank you so much for joining me. If you are new and you haven't, will you subscribe to the channel? Will you share this where uh, wherever you would share a video, send it to people who you think could be blessed by it. Um, if you like this video and comment or interact with it, it does help it get more views and helps the channel grow. And, um, yeah, I can only do so many things with, with YouTube until the channel grows, but that's okay. God's timing. And, um, thanks for being here. Shabbat Shalom. We're going to continue to raise up a prayer, um, and petition for the people, for the hostages that still are, um, are in captivity in, Israel in, in Palestine, it, um, let's pray for them and, and keep them in our prayers and pray for peace in, Jer in, in Israel, peace in Jerusalem, where, uh, there's plenty of Psalms and scriptures that can lead us through those prayers. So we're lifting that up to the Lord this, this Sabbath and every Sabbath until everyone's home safely and that God knows the answer there. I do not. Um, but again, thank you for being here wishing everyone who's watching a peaceful Sabbath rest, and I will see you next week.